Hi, I'm Garnbreak1, and this is Midgardia's Creator Corner. I'm here today with Thomas Elliott. How's it going? It's going pretty well. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good myself. So uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do? Sure. So uh, I am a tabletop game designer. I got my start working in board and card games, but for the past few years, I've been focusing exclusively on role-playing games. My uh, first one, Murder Most Foul, is a murder mystery dinner party game that's infinitely replayable. It's critically acclaimed and a gold bestseller on Drive Through RPG. Nice. And my Oh, thank you. And my most recent game is Fear of the Unknown, which is a more traditional tabletop role-playing game. It is a zero prep and yes, I mean literally zero uh, horror mystery game. So I could, I, I've got a party I'm going to this weekend, so I could grab that, slap it on the table, and we'd be good to go. Uh, pretty much, yeah. Um, it it can't hurt to like read some of the rules beforehand before you get started but uh if you want to just take a look at the player facing rules and not the um gm tools you can get all of that on the free quick start also available on drive through rpg and that's eight pages long including one page of character sheet and one page of uh introduction so yeah like so to give an example of of what i mean by literally zero prep uh this past saturday uh my friend arranged a game of fear of the unknown that i thought he was going to gm and he thought i was going to gm and so we both showed up with nothing at all prepared and several other players there and i was like oh uh okay i i, I guess i'll gm because i i have more experience doing that but <laughs> it worked out great they That's... were tra travelers stranded in an old southern plantation secretly owned by the devil who kept trying to uh, tempt them into behaving immorally. And then if they uh, whenever whenever a character did, they, they died in an ironic fashion. Classic. <laughs> oh, that's great. Also, the cover art is fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, I'm really happy with all of the artists that I've worked with on uh, all of my projects. And uh, this for this one, I actually had a different piece of art in mind for the cover, which I think I can have uh, here. You, you get to take a sort of exclusive look at the original unused cover art. Um, here, I'll turn off this red light so you can get more true color. Uh, cool. Uh, it's, yeah, it's it's inspired by the old third edition Dungeons and Dragons sort of skeuomorphic making it look like an actual creepy tome or whatever. Yeah. But then I got, then I got this screaming woman face as just what was intended as like a in piece of interior art and then I was like, "Oh man, this is this is great and really sells the sort of 80s horror movie vibe that I'm going for." So I'm going to use it as the cover art. Yeah, like I'm a huge fan of the the third edition 3.5 like trade dress like that is the gold standard for D, D books in my personal opinion uh but the new cover is definitely better <laughs> thanks yeah yeah i i love that uh design style that they used there but it does work better for a like a fantasy thing than for a, a horror thing yeah unfortunately it it the the old cover gives almost an escape room kind of vibe though yeah, that was intended as the, um, like, that was the full-color hardcover with extra stuff in it uh, stretch goal thing for the Kickstarter, but we didn't make it to that, so maybe someday. At least it means I didn't have to do all the layout work for it. <laughs> <laughs> Instead, I got the much simpler black-and-white version that's much easier to do the layout work for. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you uh, You seem to have a bit of a thing for horror. Oh yeah, definitely. It's my favorite genre. Um, I love creating horror stories, watching horror movies, uh, all, all sorts of stuff. Uh, I think it's one of the genres that's most amenable to sort of... Um, outsider art isn't quite the right term, but I guess like uh, amateur in the traditional sense of meaning done for the love of the genre. Um, I, th I find a lot more like really low budget horror films that are actually really good and enjoyable than I do for pretty much any other genre of, of movie. Right. Like, like the original evil dead and that kind of stuff. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
like very those low movies budget. are great <laughs> yeah like very low budget you know super indie like all the bloods chocolate milk you know i think i might be wrong uh, about that no um you're probably thinking of the original psycho where they use chocolate mm. syrup chocolate yeah. milk isn't viscous enough the blood that you typically see in any color low budget horror film is uh high fructose corn syrup with um uh red food dye and a little bit of green food dye just to give it more more depth of color i guess yeah because uh actual blood is more complex than being just plain vivid red yeah so. <laughs> uh this is a bit of an aside but when i was in when i was in high school we did a, a haunted house for halloween uh, that i was part of the production of oh cool one of the girls in my class brought in a bucket of actual genuine deer blood uh that was so that we could use that we didn't <laughs> <laughs> yeah that uh uh if it's kept in liquid form, like blood is very high calorie, it will rot. Yep. Um, <laughs> and and if it dries, then it turns like brown and crusty and flaky and becomes, especially if it's on any sort of fabric, it becomes really difficult to clean off. Uh, so actual blood is not the best thing to use to represent blood uh, just from a practical perspective. Yeah, because if you need to do multiple takes, you're you're kind of hosed. Yeah, I recorded a short film recently where we used chocolate syrup uh, on it, and it uh, because we were filming inside of somebody's bar, and chocolate syrup is easier to clean up than corn syrup, and it, it, it's just amazing how easy that stuff is to clean compared to actual blood. Yeah, I bet. I have I have a vivid mental image of that girl just like reaching her hand into the deer deer blood bucket, pulling it out, and like messing with the viscous blood. Wow. Oh yeah, the fact that it's coagulating up yeah. on exposure to air makes it ugh, yeah that's the thing that happens <laughs> going to a high school in a relatively rural area had some quirks um <laughs> i believe it <laughs> anyway um yeah horror has never been my number one genre i've always been really bad at like running it and stuff but i'll, I'll i will definitely have to give some of your stuff a shot well thank you I hope it works out for you. I'm I'm really happy with the GM tools that are in the uh, the full rulebook. So uh, I've gotten more than one person who's like an inexperienced GM or has ha tried running a few other systems and found it really difficult to keep track of all the stuff they need to um, tell me that Fear of the Unknown is a lot easier to run because like one of my big design goals with that is like I love running games uh, and I love playing in games, but in general... I find myself frustrated when playing games because I feel like I don't have nearly as much narrative control as I would like. And I also find it stressful to run a lot of games because I feel like I have all of the burden of maintaining a coherent narrative is on my shoulders. And so what I wanted to do with Fear of the Unknown was try to sort of split that burden into three parts with the players, the GM, and the rules. Uh, each, you know, being a pillar that supports that. Uh, and so all of the actual mechanics are player facing. The GM doesn't uh, only has to worry about like calling for uh, what move is activated. And a lot of the time um, the players can explicitly say that, like, I want to investigate. Well, that's going to be the investigate move. Uh, pretty simple. Yeah. Um, and then the the GM uh, tools, none of them are actually required in order to run the game. They're all just there to make it easier to run the game. Right. So a little bit uh, powered by the apocalypse uh, influence with the the like triggering moves kind of structure. Is that is that fair to say? Oh, oh yeah. It's yes. It's explicitly a powered by the apocalypse game. Okay. Um, it's the two d six plus stuff. Um, but where a lot of uh. PBTA games have like different ability scores and that you add to the, your moves and different playbooks. Um, one of the things that I really wanted to do in Fear of the Unknown is sort of move away from, uh, how do I explain this? Okay, so as someone who watches lots of horror movies, like lots and lots of horror movies, um, probably more than you're guessing, uh, the there is this 
idea among the public who has only seen some horror movies, especially if they've only seen like a few famous ones and double, especially if they've mostly seen ones that are deliberately riffing on earlier ones like Cabin in the Woods. Uh, there's this idea that all horror movies have the same or like all slasher movies have all the same uh, like character archetypes like, oh, there's the stoner. Oh, there's the virgin. Oh, there's the slutty one. Oh, there's the jock. That kind of thing. When really that is not the case. Uh, horror movies have an incredible diversity of characters in them. And that's one of the things that I like. Uh, so much about the genre and something that I really wanted to capture in Fear of the Unknown is that uh, most horror movies, uh, unlike, say, f fantasy films like Lord of the Rings or something, uh, and definitely completely different from, like, superhero films, um, they're not about special people seeking out specific challenges or, like, acting with goals uh, that they are using their their unique, unique abilities to try to enact on the world. Instead, they're about normal people who happen to find themselves in a terrible situation. And so they really aren't, like, I mean, like, watch Rosemary's Baby and try to tell me, like, which one of them is the slut. Like, no, I mean, come on. That, that, that's not how... That's not how these movies are actually structured. And so what I wanted um, to do with Fear of the Unknown in terms of character creation is I wanted to make it so that uh, you're not being pushed into any sort of archetypes. So there are no playbooks. Everybody creates characters the same way. Um, and you're not incentivized to make a character who's like, oh, well, my character is a private investigator who used to be a Navy SEAL. Uh, you can make a character who's like that, but that character will be exactly as mechanically effective as someone who's like, oh, well, my character is a little old lady who has a sewing club that she goes to every week. Because uh, instead of being based on like a pre preordained list of skills or based on different ability scores that can be higher or lower than each other, um, instead, what you have is tags, which are short descriptive phrases that describe like your strengths and weaknesses. And so like former Navy SEAL would be a tag and has a book club that she attends is would be a tag. And both of those uh, would be invoked in the same way. Like if you're doing an investigate check and you're like, OK, well, I want to use the fact that I'm a former Navy SEAL to my advantage. You'd be like, great, that's one of the up to three positive tags you can pick. It gives you plus one. And the other person's like, oh, well, I want to use the fact that I'm in this book club to my advantage. And then, uh, sure, that's one of the three that they can pick, and it gives her plus one. Uh, and then the... So mechanically, they're treated the same, but then within the fiction, uh, what the moves generally, especially the investigate move, do is that they take the different tags that you pick, or the, the player making the roll picks up to three positive tags, and the uh, GM picks up to two negative tags, which subtract one from the roll. And each of these tags is a different fictional element that's coming into play. And so you uh, create a scene that is sort of built out of those fictional elements. So if you're like, okay, well, uh, I'm a you know, former Navy SEAL and I like uh, have contacts in the criminal underworld and it's like, okay, but I'm invoking your old war wound. Okay, well, then we're going to get like a scene of the person going around, uh, you know, being a scary dude who's threatening members of the underworld in, a, in order to try to find the answer to their question. Whereas if you have like the little old lady in the book club, you can have things like, oh, well, I'm going to invoke my book club tag. I'm going to invoke that I'm the town gossip. And the person's like, okay, but I'm going to invoke that um, like the mayor doesn't like you. And because that's a tag that that person created during character creation, for example. Um, and then you can see how even if they're both trying to answer the same question and they're both rolling with a plus one, you've got two very different scenes going on here. And so uh, that's what I'm talking about in terms of the like trying to put the narrative weight partially on the mechanics. It's like you create all these tags at the beginning during the setting and character creation portion of the game. Uh, and then when you're playing, you're just picking from the list of tags that you've already generated. And because of how combinatorics works, you have uh, an enormous variety of possible combinations that will help you generate different scenes.
Awesome. Also, I really want a montage of those two scenes, you know, going back and forth. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I, there's a lot of examples and stuff like that uh, in the rule book. Um, the the one that I went with for really showing the difference there is, I think, those like uh, the the underworld connections, like mafioso type character and the uh, the gardener, and they're both trying to find the source of, like, somebody was poisoned, and they both want to try to figure out where the poison came from. Again, wonderful. Just the contrast between those two scenes would be lovely. You know, like, you've got the, uh, the Navy dude just, like, angrily staring at a guy stabbing a knife into a table, and it cuts the old lady, like, having tea with somebody's wife. Yeah, yeah. So tell me about <laughs> the swamp monster, dearie. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that is wonderful, and I am, I, I really want to play this. Uh, that is, <laughs> that is the curse of this program. I feel that a lot. Yeah, uh, I'm putting together an open game some upcoming Sunday. I haven't picked a date yet, but, uh, if you'd be interested, we can, uh, talk more offline. Yes. And by offline, I mean not yeah. during this. <laughs> you know <laughs> what I mean. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, what got you into to tabletop role-playing games? Uh, as a designer or as a player? Yeah, sure, let's go with that as a designer. Uh, so as a designer, I'd, I've been playing role-playing and tabletop games for, uh, and, and role-playing and board games for a long time. I've been, um, designing and publishing role-playing games. Um, excuse me. I've been designing and publishing board games, uh, uh, for a few years and making a, like, very, very meager, but noteworthy, uh, uh, living off of that. And... Um, basically I got tired of how much of an enormous pain in the ass it is to do all of the stuff. Like there, there are no board game factories in America. You cannot print a board game in America. And so you have to print it either in basically Germany or China, or nowadays there's also stuff in like Vietnam and, and places like that. But, um, that means that you have to not just hire like you know, someone to, to do like a factory to do the printing. You need someone to pick it up from the factory. You need someone to put it on a boat. You need the boat to take it uh, across the ocean. You need somebody to take it off the boat. You take it from the port to the warehouse. You need to get it from the warehouse to the individual customers. And that's only if you're doing direct to uh, consumer sales. If you're trying to do stuff to, that will end up in retail, then you also need to get a contract with a consolidator who will try to sell it to distributors, who will try to sell it to retail stores, who will try to sell it to customers. And all of those steps are expensive and a giant pain in the ass. And if you mess them up at any point, you just wasted thousands of dollars because like now you need to do it again uh, because they they weren't there to pick up your shipment or they were there, but it got delayed by three days or whatever. And uh, so I decided to um, I was I was working on uh Murder Most Foul because um, I've been doing uh, like the sort of how to host your murder, murder mystery, dinner party in a box games. Uh, but I was kind of frustrated with those just as a customer because um, while they're really cool and, and a lot of fun, they're also basically like pre-written. Like you're not actually creating the story you're just acting it out and only discovering it as you act it out which means that i don't really feel like i have a, any really narrative control over what's going on and also they have spoilers like once you've played one you can't really do it again because it's spoilers and each one of them is like 40 or 50 bucks uh so i decided to create a rule set that i could just keep using uh and not have to keep buying new ones and so uh i made murder most foul where the um one player is the host who gets murdered one player is the detective who tries to solve the murder and everyone else is a suspect who tries to commit the murder and then get away with it so even if you play with the exact same setup and the same people playing the same characters it won't necessarily turn out the same way because among the suspects it's a game of skill to see who can actually commit the murder but then if you're too obvious about it and the detective accuses you, you lose. Uh, so so it's a sort of push your luck sort of thing. Um, and I had a great time playing and, and running that. And I was like, hey, I should publish this. Uh, and, and so I did. And because print on demand has gotten 
so incredibly high quality over the past 15 years or so. Um, I was able to print it through drive-thru RPG and ship it directly to customers and only print exactly the number of copies I need and just like order an arbitrary number of extra ones to be sent to myself to sell at conventions and things like that. And it's, I, I'm making less money, but at like a tiny fraction of the headache. Uh, and this happened at around the same time that I decided that the amount of money that I was making doing board games was just not enough. Uh, and so like I have a maths degree, I decided to get into uh, computer programming. Um, and so now I have a day job as a computer programmer and I'm making about half as much money each year uh, by selling role-playing games as I was by selling uh, uh, board games, but with one one thousandth the stress. And also I have enough free time to have an entire extra job that makes several times what I used to make selling board games. Yeah, it's not a lucrative profession. Yeah, it's really, the margins are really thin. Uh, and and if you have a flop and you end up with too many of a thing, you're, there's, there's a lot of ways to get screwed over, uh, even, even when nobody's trying to screw anybody over. Yeah. So I'll it's see. a stressful job. Yeah. Also, yeah, print-on-demand is, like, is miraculous these days. Yeah, and, and there is uh, some print-on-demand board game stuff, but unfortunately, the, uh, the quality is not super-duper. It's not comparable with offset printing for board games, and it is much more expensive. Whereas for print-on-demand for books, the quality is comparable to offset printing, and while it is slightly more expensive per unit, uh, the minimum purchase is much, much lower. The minimum purchase is one instead of like thousands. And uh, the the difference in price is really not as large as, as a lot of people might expect. Yeah, um, it, it used to be substantial, but not so much now. And like, yeah. it's a book. We know how to make books. There's not a lot of yeah. individual <laughs> components to a book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And like uh, Lightning Source, which is the printer that Drive-Thru RPG uses, has... Uh, a factory in the USA and a factory in England, which uh, for a little while was extremely convenient for shipping to EU residents, but no longer um, because of Brexit. Yeah. Uh, but it is still <laughs> way more convenient than having to ship from China in the first place. Yeah. It's probably still cheaper to ship to me in Canada from the uh, England factory, honestly. <laughs> American shipping prices are bizarre, man. Yeah, I, I don't know... I don't have any ability to choose which factory sends it to you, and I don't know how they make that decision. Like, it's obvious if, you know, oh, you're in Scotland, yeah, we'll ship it to you from England. Or if you're in France, yeah, we'll probably, I assume that's shipping it from England. Um, but if you're in Canada, I, I don't know. It's an interesting question. Yeah. I mean, I'll be able to tell by the, uh, the amount that it charges me for shipping, because if it's 20 bucks, it's America. Oh, okay. Is that a... It pretty I was gonna ask, is that a customs thing or it's not customs. American shipping has just been really bad for the past few years. Huh. Sh shipping within America isn't that bad. Yeah, it's just something to do with um near the end of Trump's administration, they scrapped a bunch of machines, I guess. Oh god, that whole thing. Yes. Yeah, I have a friend who works at the post office and so I had a a, a little bit of uh a, a inside seat watching that and it was it was terrible yeah as far as i understand that's the main issue but like <clears throat> oh excuse me i can get stuff shipped in a comparable time from like china to here for a third of the cost it it blows wow. my mind that's yeah. that's bizarre yeah i don't uh somebody in the comments if you understand shipping please please explain <laughs> i don't get it <laughs> Yeah, and I'll I'll reach out to one bookshelf, the people who run Drive Through RPG, and ask them uh, which factory they ship to Canada from, because because I'm curious now. Oh, cool. Yeah, uh, let me know. That'd be that'd be nice to know. So I my shelf is currently full, but someday I'll have another shelf. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, my uh, my partner uh, uh, sat me down yesterday and was like, "Okay, we've bought three new bookshelves in the past two months and filled them all up." 
slow down a bit until you've actually read all the books you bought recently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can see on top of mine, there's like books stacked on top of them. Like, I yeah. think that's the Dragon Ball Z tabletop RPG set in sideways there. <laughs> nice. Here, I'm going to pick up my webcam and, and point. Uh, is, is th this is going to be video posted as well, yeah, right? Yeah. Okay. Right, I'm going to pick up my on. webcam and, and point it at uh, what is now only a portion of my RPG collection because I rearranged some of it. Um, Going on an adventure. Yeah. There's oh, nice. my D and D and things that are basically like D and D and also Call of Cthulhu. Um, and here's a chunk of my indie stuff. Ah, uh, yeah, um, stubborn villainy. Uh, yeah, yeah. I've got a bunch, and then these are the ones that I haven't read yet. Um, and uh, not counting the ones that I've put downstairs for uh in, in like the the entertainment room for guests to be able to flip through or um but on my bedside table because those are the ones i'm actively reading right now <laughs> yeah <laughs> i've read a good chunk of the ones behind me most of them. <laughs> uh, as long as nobody asks how many of them we've played yeah yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's the dangerous question um so, Got at least three different hobbies going on here. Playing yeah. RPGs, collecting RPGs, and reading RPGs. <laughs> yeah, like, there are definitely some things on that shelf I have very little intention of running, like the Dragon Ball Z tabletop RPG. <laughs> I love DBZ, yeah. but that is a hell of a system. <laughs> yeah, like, I have a, I think, second edition cult here, and I'm like, it was, it's cool, I'm glad I, I own it and was able to read it but I really doubt it's ever hitting the table. Um, a lot of these I've read and learned from, even without playing them. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's there's a lot of valuable insight, especially in, like, weird old stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I was at uh, Gen Con one or two years ago. Time has started compl completely blending together. Uh, because of the pandemic and I found a, uh, I was at the charity auction and I got a copy of Tune, nice. uh, which I've been looking for for decades. So very happy to have that. Yeah, I used to I used to end up in Cleveland every once in a while for reasons. Nice. That's in really good condition, too. Yeah, I had uh, is, um, like somebody drew on the sides with a crayon, <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, I. I, yeah, I, I don't. I'm not. I'm not one of those guys who keeps their action figures mint in box. Um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, it came with two other books as well. There were also tune books, so I'm very happy about that. Yeah, I found like a mint condition plastic wrapped copy of Teenagers from Outer Space at a place near here for like fifteen bucks. I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll take that off your hands. <laughs> oh, that's great. Which edition was it? Is it the '90s or the '80s version? Uh, that is a very good question. Uh, uh, sure. So, so like the first edition was, um, so both of them are comedy role playing games. I was actually writing an essay about comedy. That is the second edition, or or possibly third. Uh, it's uh, got the fusion and anime mechanics markings on the back. Yeah, it's. I was I was writing an essay about early humor RPGs recently, and that's and that that's one of them. But then I realized as I was writing it that I I only had access to like second editions of all of these games and so i couldn't really write about like the early stuff but um teenagers from outer space is actually especially interesting because the first and second editions are actually quite different from each other um they're both comedy sort of science fiction games but the original one is parodying old like 50s sci-fi films and like 80s and, and trying to emulate like 80s science fiction comedy things like honey i shrunk the kids or back to the future uh whereas the 90s one completely shifted gears to be about anime huh. and so uh and that's by far the more famous edition um the, the version you've got there is is definitely the most popular one um and i find it really interesting both to compare and contrast those two and just because the 90s one is this like like this snapshot of what anime was like in the mid 90s um like 
like it it just it tells you how to pronounce anime in the introduction <laughs> the concept of moe didn't exist yet uh it, it's it's so interesting looking at what used to be like core tropes of anime and are now forgotten almost yeah original big eyes small mouth is also incredible it's just incredible for that uh oh i yes. have some of that kicking around i've got the like serial experiments lane uh ultimate fan guide which has like 15 pages of rpg supplement in the back oh it's, that's great it's so I, weird I... <laughs> I think I have a copy of of Besom around here somewhere, but I think it's one of it's one of those games that, uh, that I have where it's actually falling apart, and so I don't really ever like touch it. <laughs> That's fair, but yeah, like once yeah. again, I just found a stash of weird Besom stuff at a nearby like place for fifteen bucks each. I'm just like, yo, take that Lane book. I'll, I'll take this copy of like Sailor Moon Book of Yoma Volume One, sure. <laughs> That's fantastic. Where are you finding those deals? Uh, Edmonton mostly, Edmonton, Alberta, and sometimes I used to go to Cleveland occasionally. And let let me rephrase: are, are are you finding these at like thrift shops or comic book stores or garage sales? Or? Uh, mostly comic book shops. Like interesting. There's one weird place that I don't know how they price their inventory, but uh, yeah, most of the like fifteen dollar ones were from there, and they're in gorgeous condition and like. I don't know where they came from. <laughs> That's awesome. And I also got uh, Edge of the Empire, like the FFG Star Wars for $35 from a used bookstore because the guy he... misread the price tag on it and I didn't realize until after I left. It what was, was supposed, it supposed to be, to be? $135. Wow. I was looking is that at the... is, is that the one that had the dice with the weird symbols on them? Yes. It d oh, I, I do not one. have the dice, but uh, yeah, I was Nobody. looking at it later. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> Yeah. Um if you're if you're looking for the dice, the official ones aren't produced anymore. So buying official ones from somebody's set are probably going to be pretty expensive, but people have recreated them uh and like do custom molds of them and sell them on Etsy. Nice. Yeah, somebody somebody near me was selling the uh the official like Edge of the Empire starter set which comes with the dice for 20 Canadian dollars and I was like, I want it, but Oh, yeah, that's a great price. Yeah, but uh in practice, I'm never going to actually roll those dice. They're going to get lost under a couch or something, so... <laughs> yeah, yeah, as much as I love beautiful, unique dice, almost all the beautiful, unique dice I've ever owned have gotten lost, so... I've I've got a box that is... I had to split my dice collection into weird dice and dice that I could plausibly use, and it's two separate boxes now. <laughs> That's fantastic. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. I got these, um... These oh, yeah. dice from Black Oak Workshop nice. for uh for, for Fear of the Unknown. Those are very uh, which uses, cool. Uses two d six. Yeah, they're they're really neat and they're they're great because like you count up the number of slashes on them. And that's the number that it's showing, and that takes a moment. It's you can't just look at it and immediately recognize it the way you can with pips or or a digit, and so uh, it adds just this like little extra moment of tension, which I really enjoy. Are those still for sale, or was that like a Kickstarter exclusive? Uh, they are for sale. So these were n these are not a custom mold. I basically I just purchased them wholesale from the right. the the guy, and and he was really nice. He uh, like I, I approached him at um, I think it was at uh, Genghis Khan in Denver, Colorado. That's a great USA. Name. Yeah, yeah, and it's a, it's a, the longest running convention in a gaming convention in oh. Colorado. Um I've been going to it since I was like probably 13. Um and and that was not the first year that it was running. <laughs> uh but yeah, he he had a, a Black Oak Workshop booth there and I just went up to him and I was like, "Hey, I'm working on this game and uh I love your dice. Any chance I could get some custom dice?" And we talked pricing and I was like, okay, I cannot afford to get custom dice, but how about just like a bulk order of these? And he's like, oh yeah, I mean, I only sell that to businesses, but the way you've been talking, I'm confident you're a real business and not just some guy trying to scam me into cheaper dice. So I bought like, uh, I think 200 of them from him. So it was really nice. <laughs> I will, I will keep that in mind. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's great. Not just trying to scam me into into selling two hundred dice, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, 
you don't just do tabletop RPG stuff. You also have a film podcast. Is that is that right? Uh, yeah, I have a podcast where I interview independent filmmakers, almost but not exclusively uh, horror filmmakers. Nice. Can you uh, tell me a little bit about that? Like, how'd you get into that and all that? Sure. So, so actually, I started it, we're coming up on the, uh, depending on when this episode is released, it'll either be shortly before or shortly after the uh, one-year anniversary of me starting the podcast in July 2022. The podcast is called Invasion of the Pod People, and you can find it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, whatever. Um, I initially started it with the intention of it being sort of a promotional thing for Fear of the Unknown. Um, where I was like, oh, you know, podcasts, it's a low commitment, easy to do thing, relatively speaking, compared to like spending $500 a day on Facebook ads. Um, so I'm going to uh, do that, maybe uh, do some actual plays, do a few episodes that are just about like horror or whatever. Uh, and then I I interviewed a guy that I knew um who was a producer on the film uh, Dog Soldiers, which is a movie about the, uh, the SAS fighting werewolves. Um, that's Brian Patrick O'Toole. Uh, and that interview went really well. So I reached out to a few other filmmakers and, and interviewed them, and that also went really well. And it turns out that I just actually really enjoy interviewing people. Uh, and apparently I'm good at it because more than one person that I've interviewed has, has complimented me on it, which is very satisfying. Um, so it's switched to being in, uh, af after like two or three months of, of doing sort of miscellaneous things, I was like, okay, no, this is an interview podcast now. So it's, it's just me interviewing people. Um, and it's going great. Uh, I'm, I'm really happy with it and I'm going to be doing a special one year retrospective slash awards show, giving out awards to different people that I interviewed in the past year, uh, coming out in July to celebrate the, the one year anniversary of doing it. Nice. That, that name is inspired by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I, I, I named it that. And then later discovered that there is like, I guess, a defunct podcast that uses the same name um, or used the same name. But like every name I came up with, I would then search and I was like, oh, OK, well, there's a much more popular podcast already using this name. Can't do that. Uh, and uh, eventually I just went with this one. Um, so I'm glad you like it. <laughs> hey, it's 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 evocative. It's it sets the tone. <laughs> yeah and i i open each episode addressing the uh listeners welcome back pod people today my guest is and then you know introduce them and that uh if if the guest has not listened to any of the episodes of the podcast then that line always gets a chuckle out of them <laughs> <laughs> yeah no for sure <laughs> god that's great well, thank you. Back to tabletop RPGs. Horror is an infamously hard genre to do. How did you kind of, how do you deal with that? Uh, so I think that the reason people consider horror to be an inf uh, an infamously difficult genre to do is because um, the, the people who say that, I think, are aiming for something slightly different than what I'm aiming for and what I advocate uh, aiming for. Namely, um, are, are you familiar with like Nordic LARP and uh, the, the, there's, there's this, this, this school of, uh, of, of role-playing games. It's called Nordic LARP, but many of them are not LARPs. Um, but that, that, and, and it's not exclusive to that school either, but like, there's this idea among many, among a, small but important minority of role-playing gamers where the purpose of the role-playing game is to evoke specific emotions in the players. And so I think a lot of people approach horror or like thinking about horror role-playing game from that perspective, where the goal is to evoke fear or terror or disgust uh, or what have you in the players. And that is not what I am really going for. Uh, my intention is to 
uh, create a game that collaboratively tells a good and entertaining and enjoyable story where the characters experience fear and terror and disgust and, and things like that. And so I think that the, um, uh, like it, it is, it is uncommon for a horror film to genuinely scare me or genuinely, uh, disgust me. It is much more common for it to just entertain me and interest me and intrigue me and make, and, and, uh, make me think about either about like the situations or the characters or the filmmaking techniques or, uh, anything like that. And I don't like, and I can be emotionally moved by a film, even though I'm not experiencing the same emotions that the characters are. And so similarly, I can have an emotionally satisfying experience playing a role-playing game, even though I'm not experiencing the same emotions that my characters are. Uh, and so like, like I've, I've been in dangerous situations and uh, where like I was scared that someone might cut me or whatever. Um, and that sucks. Like, it's a shitty experience. Uh, you don't want to do it. And so I don't want to actually relive that when I play a horror role-playing game, just like I don't want to feel what I would actually feel if I was fighting a real dragon uh, in real life. I want to feel what I would feel when I was watching a movie about someone fighting a dragon or reading a book about someone fighting a dragon. Uh, and similarly, I want to ex play a role-playing game and experience what I would experience when I watch a movie where someone is being murdered, or I read a book where someone is being murdered. I don't want to feel what I would feel if someone was really murdering me. Uh, and so I think that a lot of the, um, the reputation for horror being difficult is that it is genuinely very difficult to actually evoke uh, fear in a, a player in a game. Um, disgust is pretty easy. You could just you could just describe gr gross things that, but that's not a challenge. Um, uh, uh, eyeballs so, where eyeballs shouldn't be. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, not where I was gonna go, but sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but like the yeah, I, I so so I think that's the perspective that a lot of people are coming at it with because they think about a game like I mean, ob the big obvious one that of course everything gets compared to and which i did earlier with the dragon uh in dungeons and dragons i think a lot of people think about it as like oh well i'm excited when i play this game and my character is excited and i'm like okay but that's because your character if they were a real person would either be like an invincible superhero or would be like a psychopath um because if you're if there's a real person who fights monsters, either they're an invincible superhero or like in a different kind of D&D campaign, there's a real person who goes around like killing people who sell weapons and stealing all their weapons. Like th those are crazy people. That's not how a normal person would actually react in those situations. You wouldn't be excited. You would be terrified if you're fighting a dragon and you wouldn't just kill someone and take their stuff. Like, you don't do that in real life. Some people do, but not normal people. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I think a lot of people sort of put this challenge on horror as a genre that they don't put on other genres. Um, like, I doubt, it, I doubt many people are going to play Pasión de las Pasiones and actually fall in love with another PC. <laughs> uh, there's a name I haven't heard in a few years. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's been stuck in like playtest mode for longer than I expected. Yeah, but I'm looking forward to it. It's a cool game. Yeah, both it and it's like house derived uh, sibling whose name I'm forgetting. I think there was a, a sure. medical mystery. Anyway. Um, oh, that's what you meant by house. I thought you meant like like in house no, made sorry, by yeah. made by the Magpie Games people. Um, I think it's a Magpie one. I believe so. Yeah. 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 Um, anyway, yeah, horror. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, that's an excellent explanation. That actually kind of crystallizes some, like, thoughts I've had on other tabletop, tabletop RPGs, where, like, yeah, your, your characters would be horrible people. 
Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but it's not. Uh, I mean, like, just just wa- watch a big blockbuster and and imagine. I mean, just pick like a random action scene in a blockbuster movie and imagine what it would actually be like to live through it, not knowing that you have plot armor. Um, you'd be traumatized. Yep. <laughs> uh, I think it was. I think it's uh, the the OSR RPG errant that has like right at the top of character creation. Normal people don't become adventurers, or well adjusted people don't become oh, adventurers. Yeah, 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 I've read. I, I remember reading that line and going like, "All right, all right here's somebody who gets it." <laughs> uh, uh, I'm just gonna make sure my cat's okay. She's kind of okay. By all me? means. Yeah. Aww. Okay. I saw her get there. Uh, and I was like, "Oh, a cute cat." Didn't didn't occur to me she might be not be okay. And she was just like laying really weird with the top of her head on the bottom, which is not normal for her. But uh, yeah, huh. she's fine. <laughs> That's good. As soon as I moved, she's like, "Oh, hey, can you tell me a little bit about mystery design?" Which is the other like infamously difficult part of tabletop RPGs because everybody plays Dungeons and Dragons, which doesn't work well for it. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh sure. So, um. Unlike unlike horror, where I think the difficulty is sort of overstated, uh, I do think it is actually genuinely difficult to design both a game and an adventure for a game, if, if it's the kind of game that takes pre-made scenarios, uh, that is a mystery. Um, and I wrote a, a short essay on this that you can find by Googling the, the title of it, which is The Four C's of Mysteries, or C as in the letter. Um, and those are... Uh, Crime, clues, culprit, and canonicity, where what I mean by canonicity is the idea of which of these things are established as having like definite, you know, they definitely are this specific way before you start playing. And so uh, the classic way of uh, creating a mystery game in a game like Call of Cthulhu is that all of them are canonical. The, the crime is predetermined, the culprit is predetermined, and the clues are like specific things that are like, if they think to check in this drawer, they will find this letter. And if they don't think to check in that drawer, they will never find that letter. Uh, and sometimes, even if you're particularly unlucky, uh, clues can be like gated behind skill checks. Uh, where it's just, did, did you put enough points in the thing and then roll the dice well enough in order to get the clue? And if not, you're in trouble. Uh, and this, yeah, yeah. And, and this this is where ideas like the three clue rule comes from, which is written by some essayist I, whose name I can't remember at the moment, uh, where the idea is that for every three clues that you come up with, the players will only find one of them. And so for anything that you want the players to figure out, you need to put in at least three different clues that point towards that. Uh, And if you're creating a mystery for a game like Call of Cthulhu, then yeah, I think that's good advice. Um, But also I feel like that's putting an enormous amount of work, like burden on the GM. Um, even if they're running a pre-made scenario, they need to know it like the back of their hand or else they might miss something important and accidentally lock the players in a situation they can't get out of. Um, or even like, yeah, it's totally possible that like, oh yeah, the players miss two clues, but they find the third. It's also possible that the players miss all three clues. And so, uh, I think that's like, uh, that can be a real problem. Um, and so modern mystery design has sort of moved away from that uh, in a variety of ways. Like the gumshoe system famously got rid of the idea of locking clues behind the possibility of failure, where like you just, if you look for a clue, you definitely find the clue. Um, It still has all three elements, uh, the crime, culprit, and clues. All three of them are predetermined and canonical. Um, And then uh, the other one that's really popular at the moment is Brindlewood Bay. And the big innovation that they made is that they made the culprit non-canonical, which is to say that although the crime is predetermined and if you're running a pre-made scenario, uh, there is like a list of clues that you can find, but they're things like a bloody handkerchief and it doesn't, and and they're, they're made a little bit broader in that it doesn't say specifically where they are they're just like okay this is a clue i can incorporate somehow um and they're 
Uh, but the big the big difference between Brindlewood Bay and older mystery games is that the culprit is not predetermined. Instead, you uh, as you gather evidence, you become more and more likely to be able to successfully pin the crime on someone uh, if you roll well enough. And uh, this is a really cool innovation, but it can also be really frustrating for some players. Like I, I ran a game of it uh, when I was still designing Fear of the Unknown um, for a uh, some friends of mine, and one of them was talking about it with me afterwards, and he was saying that like because there wasn't an actual predetermined uh, culprit that we were trying to discover it didn't feel like i was playing a detective who was trying to find out the answer i felt like i was playing like a cop or a lawyer who was trying to pin the crime on someone um which i think is a really fair criticism uh although it also sort of um mirrors reality in that way in that although the culprit like there is a real person who committed whatever crime was committed if if somebody committed a crime in reality you can never actually be completely certain that you've caught the right person. You can just become increasingly confident and, and like certain of, of that. Um, so I, I definitely see the strengths and, and weaknesses of, of that approach. What I did with Fear of the Unknown is I make the crime and the culprit canonical and the clues are not. Uh, you, there's GM tools that help you determine um, who the antagonist is and what it is that they're doing. Uh, and then all of the clues are created in the scenes that are generated using that investigate move, where it's a combination of what is the question that the player is asking and what uh, tags are being invoked on, like what's, what is the scene that we are creating. And uh, it's while it's not quite as strictly yes you definitely always find a clue as gumshoe is uh it's still very much in that direction um you have to both roll poorly and then the gm chooses not to have a clue be one of the things that happens anyways um and in, in order to miss it, in order to not get a clue and so the question for the gm becomes uh given that they're in this situation and they're trying to answer this question. What is a piece of information that I can put in that situation that either answers their question or like gives them, you know, a partial answer to the question. Right. I really like that. That seems, I want to say a lot more fair than the Brindlewood Bay approach, but like <laughs> a lot more, some old FMV games would, would randomize like who the culprit of a murder mystery was. So you end up with a bunch of evidence that's like, it could plausibly point to any one of these three people, and I won't really know until I switch to disc two where it actually, you uh, know, uh, River yeah. is the big one there. Yeah. Yeah. So like if you end up in a situation in Fear of the Unknown where you're like, oh, I have these three culprits and they're all, or these three potential culprits, and they're all like equally suspicious at the moment, then of course the next question you're going to ask is going to be something like, how do I like distinguish between these two culprits or like can i eliminate this person as as the possible actual person behind everything um and then you generate a scene with the investigate move and you've, you've got this nice little loop going um yeah going through like cctv footage to establish somebody was somewhere you know that kind of stuff yeah yeah exactly uh can, can does this person have an alibi for that evening and can we confirm it that sort of thing yeah yeah uh my my partner and i played through a, a hunt a killer season a while back and we got to that one moment where somebody like it's it's like a murder mystery subscription box thing if you're not I, i'm a, i'm aware of i've never played it but i'm aware of it and I've, I've heard good things it comes with very cool props including a toque that i regularly use during the winter still so <laughs> oh wow yeah cool <laughs> um if you can actually kind of see it uh, somewhere over there is like a little green blotch it's i i think i see it yeah yeah just like in the corner of the chair um uh, the big fancy one is for when it gets actually cold but <laughs> ah. anyway uh there was this moment when we were working on the last box when like we realized that all the times lined up so only one person could be it and i like shouted in joy that we had nailed the culprit 
That's good. Yeah, that that's awesome. Yeah, so like like that as an example of a mystery role playing game uh, is one where. Uh, it sort of takes the same approach as those um, how to host a murder games where uh, the mechanics take on an enormous amount of the uh, difficulty of like the narrative effort required to run it. Uh, but that's because you're buying like a pre-made story that has been worked on really hard by some people. And then once you play it, you can't play it anymore. Yeah, like the only repl replayability I'm getting of this is uh, when it's minus 15 out and I need a mild toque. <laughs> <laughs> minus 15 is a mild toque? Oh yeah, it gets down to like minus 30 out here, man. Oh, like my regularly <laughs> in the winter. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's what the, really cold. That's what the big hat with the ear flaps is for. <laughs> ah. uh, Canada is dangerous. <laughs> yeah, I live in, in Colorado, but not up in the Rockies. Um, and it, it occasionally gets kind of cold, like it gets below freezing, uh, but never that cold. <laughs> yeah. It, uh, some years are worse than others, but, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's no Antarctica. Um, but we, we do, we are occasionally the coldest place on earth. Like it usually once or twice. Wow. A yeah. Wow. Jeez. Yeah. I try not to go outside, but, uh. <laughs> uh, sensible yeah that's understandable i wouldn't i wouldn't either <laughs> it is amazing that i still have all of my fingers and toes <laughs> uh kudos <laughs> oh, i'm God. glad you do i used to work a work a job where i had to take the bus home at like 10 30 at night and sometimes i had to wait up to 45 minutes for that bus oh boy i was cold <laughs> yeah that sounds very cold yeah anyway oh, man well Thomas, it's been lovely talking to you about an astonishing array of things, quite frankly. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there will be links to, uh, to, again, a wide variety of things down in the comments <laughs> below. Uh, Go check them out, buy some stuff, run a murder mystery for your friends. Solve yeah. a murder mystery with your friends. <laughs> yeah. And uh, also check out Invasion of the Pod People, and then you too can become one of the pod people. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, if you're interested in uh, how films get made, um, especially low-budget, micro-budget, independent films, uh, that is that is the specialty of the people I, I talk with. Thank you so much for having me on. This has been a lot of fun. Oh, yeah, I've, I've, I've been very glad to have you. And uh, for those of you watching at home, have a good night.